guys. Today we're going to learn a little bit about silk. So let's get started. So silk is um, a very interesting and beautiful fabric, um, of course made from the cocoon of the silk moth, although he looks furry enough that we could probably shear him, uh, but of course he's not too big. Uh, so we do get it from the cocoons, of course, um, all the little silks that the silkworm individually sort of spins out of itself to wrap itself in its cocoon, get unraveled in sort of a boiling water, and we're able to make um, some very beautiful, very lustrous, very strong fabric out of this fiber. So what are the overall properties of silk? It has a beautiful, natural, shiny luster. It is very strong, strongest of all the natural fibers. Um, of course, there are a couple synthetics that are stronger, but of our natural ones, it is very, very strong. It is, however, sensitive to bleach, sunlight, and perspiration. So sunlight can make it fade. Uh, bleach does you know, terrible things to the colors and can kind of corrode it and, and may weaken it a bit. Uh, and so can perspiration, actually. So you have to be very careful when you do make clothing that will sit next to the body uh, made out of silk. Uh, it has to be cleaned quite frequently and uh, quite carefully as well. It's the easiest natural fiber to dye and um, was a favorite for vibrant prints and dyeing before um, sort of better dyeing methods came about. So today we live in a wonderful day uh, where we can basically dye anything, any color that we'd like. Um, but silk tends to dye very, very easily, so before we had this, it still could be dyed any color of the rainbow um, very, very vibrantly and keep that dye uh, in that same color for a very, very long time. Um, it's also very warm. Um, we don't typically think of silk as sort of that warm, insulating fiber like we think of uh, wool is. Um, but it is. It's, it's quite warm. We don't typically have, you know, sort of big, thick, woolly coatings made out of uh, silk. Um, but it still has great insulative properties, um, even though it's not usually specifically for um, that kind of garment. Now while we're here talking a little bit about silk overviews, I want to talk a little bit about the Mame weight. Um, lightweight to medium weight silks are often measured using the weight unit called the Mame, uh, or the Mami. Mame, Mami, um, as you feel a little silly saying the mommy, but it's uh, it's definitely not the mummy. <laughs> a lot of people say mummy, it's not mummy, it's mommy. Um, so a mom is, is roughly equal to about one ounce per square yard of fabric. Um, and this term basically comes from a traditional method of measurement. Um, and of course, silk has a long, long history uh, throughout Asia, especially in uh, of course, its country of origin, um, where it was invented, uh, uh, China, but also got exported to Japan. And uh, so they have created this uh, uh, unit of measurement that, uh, of course, uh, talks about the actual physical weight of the fabric, but it's also a good indicator of uh, thread count. So if you imagine if it weighs more, it's more dense, it also has more threads in it to be able to get there. So a lot of times when we use uh, mame weight in uh, um, advertising and things like that, it's used like thread count is here. So if you go and get bedding, um, you know, cotton bedding, you'll see, oh, it's, you know, it's a 600 thread count, so on and so forth. If you go and get silk sheets, um, especially silk sheets from silk um, produced in Asia, they might say, oh, it's, um, you know, a 10 uh, uh, mommy weight. Um, here on the right, I have basic weights. Um, so Mame is uh, uh, basically abbreviated the same way as uh, millimeters, so MM. Um, so if you see that um, for fabrics, especially silks, it's, it's not millimeters, um, it's Mame. And uh, basically, uh, they'll have different varieties of silks. Any silk can typically be weighed uh, with the Mame weight. Uh, but we'll typically see basically lightweight to medium weight silks. Um, in, uh, so we have here, the, I think the heaviest I have on this chart is about either the raw silk or the four ply silk. Um, and they're by no means heavyweight fabrics. Um, they're more medium weight. 
but it really is for the you typically see it in a lot of the lighter weight fabrics uh silk fabrics all right so that's that don't be confused about what it means when you see it on your fabric it's basically just saying how much does that uh fabric weigh per square yard um and again the lighter the lighter uh, uh the fewer threads uh the less dense it is and uh, the heavier it is, the more mame it is, uh, the denser it is. We're going to begin today with the satin weave, the beautiful satin weave. Um, probably best uh, um, examples of it in the silk category, but let's not forget that it had representatives in both the cotton and wool category because, again, uh, the satin weave is a weave type and not a fiber. Uh, so you can have cotton satins, uh, typically called sateens. You can have wool satins, which are, are sometimes blended with silk. Um, but again, it is when we float either the warp or weft after at least three or more of its counter uh, yarns. So we see here the weft is floating uh, three over, over three warp yarns. And these long runs or floats uh, of the satin weave give the fabric that it's applied to kind of smooth and lustrous surface. Uh, again, we sort of best see represented in the silks because we get that highly lustrous face and anything that we sort of associate with a very highly shiny, highly lustrous silk uh, typically comes from the satin weave family. Uh, very beautiful, but also the weakest weave, as I've mentioned before. Those long floats are prone to snag and not very strong, but very, very pretty. So our first uh, fabric utilizing that beautiful satin weave is Charmousse. A gorgeous, gorgeous liquidy fabric. Uh, it's soft, it's fluid, and really is, again, the perfect example of the luster we can get out of that satin weave. This super shiny fabric is, of course, luxurious and very common in the world of silk fabrics. It's one of the most common one. It's very beautiful uh, and it's lightweight. Well, I'm going to call it a little bit more medium weight. In the world of silks, we get some pretty lightweight stuff. So it's kind of on the more medium end of the lightweight scale. And it moves with just a beautiful watery drape. It just, it kind of just bounces and wiggles on its own. Um, and very, very fluid, very, very limp. Um, however, it's shiny face and it's, it's just, it, it's want to just bounce and move makes it just so hard to sew with. Um, everyone wants to make everything out of charmeuse because it's so beautiful, it looks so gorgeous, it moves so beautifully um, until they actually try to sew something with it. And it is an absolute nightmare to have to sew with. Uh, so much so that it, you have to sort of sometimes take a lot of um, extra measures and extra steps uh, that you wouldn't have to take normally with a cotton, which is, is very, very easy to sew. Silks are very difficult to sew just in general. Um, cottons are typically very easy. Wools are kind of in the middle. Um, but something like charmeuse really is just the hardest thing in the world to sew. Uh, the slippery, shiny faces, when you put uh, pieces together, um, it's, the shininess is also very, very smooth. And that smoothness is very, very slippery. So the pieces slip away from one another. Even when you fold it to cut, if you don't put something in the middle, if you have that shiny face on shiny face, it just moves all over the place. You can't cut a straight line. You get all these sort of jagged, raggedy edges. And um, it can move and stretch while sewing, which can pucker and pull your seams. And it is a nightmare, not to mention the fact that it's very difficult to iron um, because that luster uh, is very sensitive to heat and can be sort of scorched with an iron. Um, so look at it, be beautiful. If you do design something out of it, I hope you're not the one that has to sew it. Duchess Satin or Peau de Soie. Um, so I kind of group these two fabrics as sort of being the same thing. Um, and indeed, I, I would sort of say they are. And a lot of times I've seen them, their names be sort of used interchangeably for very, you know, almost identical type fabrics. Um, Peau de soie uh, in French means the skin of silk or something. And Duchess satin is satin for the Duchess. 
Um, it has a really, really long history of being, um, you know, uh, involved in clothing for royalty and aristocrats and things like that. And it is quite expensive. Um, it's very lustrous. Um, it's also a favorite for bridal gowns and other expensive dresses today. Um, it has that same sort of very high luster of charmeuse um, that that satin weave, of course, brings out again. But it's much heavier in weight and doesn't have that bouncy fluidity that charmeuse does. Instead, it's rather stiff and tends to drape in kind of wide flares. A lot of times, too, Duchess Satin or Potoswa will have a little bit of a natural curl. So if you get, like, if you cut a swatch of it, the end of it will kind of naturally just kind of curl up a little bit. Uh, but again, very, very expensive. It's, you know, silk is also uh, um, the most expensive of our natural fibers, out of all the fibers, because the synthetic ones are cheap. Um, it, it only really when you get into the specialty wools like Vicuna and, and um, uh, things like that um, do you get fibers that are more expensive than silk. And this is a very dense fabric. Remember when we have denser fabrics it takes more fiber, more fire, more raw material, they're more expensive. So Duchess satin is very, very expensive. Actually we're going to see a lot of very expensive fabrics today. <laughs> Uh, and especially here, so that kind of wraps up our, our satin weave. Uh, I know it was a sort of short section, maybe thought it was going to be a little bit longer, but um, pretty short. Um, next, we're going to go into the jacquard weave. And I just want to take a little bit uh, of a moment to uh, describe the jacquard weave. Now, this is a new weave. Um, so we've basically gone over plain weave, satin weave, and twill weave, which is our three main weaves uh, when we talk about woven fabrics. But when we talk about the jacquard weave, it's not necessarily a new weave, but it's a way of combining all of those weaves. So what we do in the jacquard weave is we combine twill weave, plain weave, and satin weave within one cloth. And that gives the cloth um, a sort of the ability to apply different textures because every single weave gives a little bit of a different texture um, to the cloth. And we can combine those in a way to create just the most ornate and complex patterns that are woven directly into uh, the fabric itself. And over here is an example on the left of a jacquard fabric. And it, again, you can see it probably uses, uh, this back is, is probably the plain weave, the shinier parts of the lighter parts, they've used the satin weave, and they kind of have this middle part, they probably use some uh, twill weave in there probably even different uh, uh, combinations of, of basket of uh, plain and, and twill weaves uh, to create these different textures that when arranged properly, uh, again, give you these beautiful complex patterns that are woven directly into the fabric. So this is not a print, this is not printed on there. That is just the fabric and, and the pattern that has been woven into the fabric and nothing has been printed on it. Um, over here on the right is what uh, a jacquard loom, even especially one of the old ones. So they're a fairly old, the, obviously the modern ones look different today, um, but this is one of the old ones. And uh, basically the loom was quote unquote programmed using these punch cards um, to tell it what kind of weave style to do. So if you think about your weaves, you know, you get your one set of yarns, let's say your warp yarns, which is your, your um, long yarns, and then you're weaving in your filler or your weft yarns, and at every warp yarn you have the option to go over it or you go under it. And of course with plain weave we just alternate that. We go over, we go under, over, under, over, under, over, under. But that's really your two options. And the punch cards will, can tell you what to do. Either if you have a hole, you can go over, you go under. Uh, you not, don't have a, a hole. Actually, I'm not exactly sure what the, what the holes, uh, whether it's over or under, I'm not quite sure. But in some way, they, they allow the shuttle to know whether to go over or under their corresponding uh, warp yarn. And this, was, uh, this loom was actually developed in the very late 1800s. Um, but is, is really uh, can be looked at as a precursor um, to a computer. Um, so these sort of punch cards are 
basically the first type of programming which went on to sort of inform how binary programming worked because of course binary programming um, takes a set of a sort of two values, a zero or a one, a yes or a no. Same thing as these punch cards. It's either a punch hole or it's not a punch hole. It's a yes or a no, it's a zero, it's a one. So it's a very, very, very early sort of rudimentary computer, um, which is, I don't know, I just find it very, very interesting. And, um, you know, we don't tend to not appreciate a lot of the technology and, and technological advances that uh, the fashion industry really has helped humanity come to make, but I like to do it. Um, so again, little history of the jacquard weave. All you really got to know is your jacquard weave is highly decorative. It's a woven in pattern and it uses a combination of all of our weave types to create that beautiful woven in pattern. Um, other thing I just want to mention too about the jacquard loom. Um, all fiber types can be woven on the jacquard loom. Um, there are very, uh, some very special silk ones um, and very specifically silk jacquards that I'm going to go over them today and that's why I've decided to put uh, the jacquard weaves in the silk section. But you can have cotton jacquards, you can have wool jacquards, it's anything woven on this jacquard loom. They can also be one color or many colors. Our first lovely silk uh, jacquard is a special jacquard called a brocade. Uh, and this has a history much lo uh, longer uh, and mu starting much earlier than the loom uh, because uh, brocades have been around, especially in Chinese culture, for a, a lot longer than the jacquard loom. Uh, the jacquard loom just helped speed up the process of making this sort of traditionally hand-woven uh, fabric. Uh, it is a rich, dense fabric, uh, originally made uh, in only all silk versions, but today uh, you can find it in, in many uh, compositions uh, and with uh, synthetic fibers and things like that. Uh, but a lot of people say true brocade uh, will only be 100% silk, but of course we have sometimes synthetic fibers that also uh, we can create brocades with today. Uh, this fabric is very easily recognizable. It has a complex, multicolored pattern uh, woven into the fabric using a jacquard loom today. Uh, brocade is very stiff and heavy in weight. And again, as I said before, it is super expensive because of its density. It's a very complex um, uh, fabric to create. So um, even though we have things like the jacquard loom today, to uh, greatly speed up the process of making these very ornately woven fabrics, it still takes a while even for the machine to do it. Um, sometimes the, the really highly ornate jacquard uh, fabrics, even on a loom, can take a day to get uh, a few yards. Um, so it's very, very expensive fabric. And again, um, if, especially if it is 100% silk, um, it's very dense and it uses, um, you know, all these different yarns for all the different colors, different colors, uh, so more colors, more complexity, more expensive, denser, more expensive, um, all these things sort of put together and then of course it being silk, which is the most expensive fiber, um, it is a very, very expensive, very, very luxurious fabric. Um, but very beautiful and, uh, of course, easily recognizable. And again, uh, so this is woven into the fabric. This is not a print. It's not been printed on there. Um, and you can tell this very easily by looking at closely at the fabric. You can see each colored yarn uh, being woven to create the patterns. It's, it is not a print. Um, I also want to take a moment to just recognize Song Rakat. Um, so song brocade refers to a traditional type of brocade that was first developed uh, by the Chinese during the Song Dynasty. That's so how God is in. Um, and these fabrics, again, are very similar to today's brocade, um, but were originally hand-woven and featured images and themes uh, traditional to Chinese culture at the time. Um, so we can sort of look at, at that. And these are very, very beautiful um, hand-woven uh, brocades, very, very detailed, very, very gorgeous. Um, um, creating these uh, uh, very, you know, highly ornate, uh, very colorful. Um, and there you can see, you know, this is such a brightly colored 
garment. This is this is a, this is not a modern garment. This is um, a an ancient garment, really, from the Song Dynasty. But you can still see how beautifully vibrant those colors are, and that is a real testament to the ability of uh, silk to keep its dye, keep keep color, dye very well, and then keep its color. Cloquet or cloak. I like cloquet. It should have a little deet right there, which means it's cloquet. Uh, this lovely fabric is woven on a jacquard loom uh, using crepe yarns. So remember our crepe yarns uh, are twisted one way and then another and kind of has that little bubbly um, uh, kind of kinky texture to it. It's not completely straight. It doesn't lay straight. It kind of kinks around. It's kind of a little bit crooked. Um, and their natural texture enhances uh, the weave done in jacquard designs and it makes it slightly puffy or puckered. Um, because it is made with these crepe yarns, it has a fluid soft drape associated with these yarns. So crepe, too, crepe yarns make some pretty nice, very flowy fabrics. And here you can see kind of the little puffed raised texture. It's a little bit, it's pretty subtle. But those, um, you know, little texture that we typically see in our, our crepe yarns are helping to and give it this sort of a little bit more texture, a little bit of puffiness to that uh, jacquard pattern. Now jacquard patterns will always have a little bit of uh, texture because it's woven in and not printed on, which has no texture. Um, but this is just, again, to enhance it a little bit. Damask. Damask, like all types of jacquard, can be woven out of other fibers. It is commonly seen in cotton and linen varieties as well. So damask is very similar to macron. Um, because, of course, we get these complex patterns woven with a jacquard loom. But there are some very distinct differences. So the woven pattern for damask is usually reversible. So you get a nice pretty pattern on both sides, where brocade is not. Typically, brocade will have one side that is very obviously the face, and then the other side really does not look like much. Um, damask's pattern usually have a flatter texture than brocade, and typically uses fewer satin floats. Um, so the floats will not go as far um, as a lot of times are brocades. So brocades, sometimes they're kind of forced to go very, very far and float over a lot of different yarns just to create the patterns. Of course, this makes it very, very um, delicate. Um, so again, the more uh, yarns you float, a satin float over, so if I take, you know, that warp or that weft yarn and float it over, you know, 10 different yarns. Um, again, I'm going to get a nice smooth surface, but that float is very prone to snag. It's making the fabric very weak. And sometimes for the brocades, especially with the multicolored brocades, we have to do that just to create the pattern. Uh, the mask typically doesn't do that. It'll stop at about um, three floats and, and not kind of go overboard. Um, and it also typically has fewer colors than brocade. So here I have an example of a typical damask, which is just one color. Um, it looks like two, but that's just the alternating satin and plain weave to make it look different. Remember, the satin weave um, highlights luster. Uh, so we have an area creating a pattern that highlights luster, therefore creates um, an, uh, it makes it look like it's a lighter color. Again, this is all the same color yarn. It's just Actually, a good example of highlighting the luster or satin weave can create. We've just used a satin weave in some areas and a plain weave in others uh, where we want to create a different pattern um, using the difference of those textures and using, you know, the uh, a different luster of, uh, that the satin weave can, can bring out. So this is actually one color, even though it looks like two. Uh, and we can have, uh, you know, two or more colors. Uh, sometimes, uh, but we rarely see damasks with more than two colors in them. Um, uh, whereas brocade is typically many, many colors in it and very, very detailed um, and very, very textured. Matelassé. So matelassé is very interesting fabric too. So matelassé means quilted in French. And it can resemble a patterned quilted effect. Uh, we haven't gone over quilted fabric, but Madelassé is not a true quilted fabric, despite its name in French. Um, when we think of a quilted fabric and talk about quilted fabric, it really refers to two different layers of fabric 
With a third layer of padding, which is typically called batting, it's like a thin sheet of like cotton ball or fluff. Um, these layers are then sort of um, layered together and stitched together with a sewing machine to create those textured patterns. And we can create very, very elaborate sewn patterns with the quilting. But again, those layers aren't woven together, they're sewn together with a machine. Um, and that's, that actual stitching from the sewing machine creates those patterns and the puffiness is created by that batting or padding uh, in the middle. And again, that's also what makes quilts so warm is because it has that padding in the middle. Madalese is different. Uh, Madalese gets its pattern texture and again, you can see here it is characterized by a raised puffy texture. Um, and it gets its puffy texture from the way it's woven. So Madalese is woven like a double cloth. Remember we talked about double cloths? Double cloths are two separate fabrics so um, that have their own warp and weft yarn. Uh, and then there's a third set of weft yarns that actually weave the two fabrics together. We talked about this in the wool section. And it creates a fabric that's fairly reversible. It can almost look like two different fabrics kind of glued back to back. Um, however, when Madalese is woven together in this double cloth style, different yarn tensions are used between the two layers and used to create these puffy patterns. So different tensions in some areas are applied, which uh, allows the sort of surface or top uh, layer of the double cloth to sort of puff out. This pattern is woven on a jacquard loom using this style of uh, double cloth weaving. So this is a very kind of complex weave uh, because not only are we already doing it on a jacquard loom, which is one of our more complex weave um, uh, you know, producers, but we're doing a double cloth. Um, again, so another sort of layer on top of the jacquard loom. And then we're also playing with the tensions of the yarn. So this is sort of like three layers of weave complexity. Uh, where we have tension, a double cloth technique, and a jacquard loom in play. Matalese. Okay, let's move on to our sheer silks. Very beautiful um, uh, section, very flowy, very airy. The first is Batiste de Soie. Basically meaning Batiste made from silk in French. Uh, this fabric is pretty much exactly as its name suggests. Uh, the fabric is made in the same way as cotton batiste is, with a very fine yarn and a tight, plain weave. It has a medium luster and is semi-sheer. It's soft and limp in drape. It's lightweight, but somewhat heavier than the other ultra-lightweight fabrics in the category. So again, we're going to see the lightest of the lightweights, not only for silk, but really of uh, all the categories we've looked at here in our sheer silk um, category. So again, it's just pretty much just a batiste uh, fabric made from silk instead of cotton. Chiffon. There is not a lighter, airier, flowier fabric than chiffon. And in, indeed, when you think of ethereal, your the fabric, in terms of fabric, might not, you know, uh, of ethereal fabrics, Chiffon is what you're thinking of, trust me. It's a sheer silk made with very, very fine crepe yarns. Again, we're seeing another appearance of those crepe yarns. Um, so it does have that crepe texture, a very sort of light pebbly texture. And it's actually, it's pretty easy to see the qualities of crepe yarns in chiffon because it has this sort of open plain weave where each yarn, again, in our open weaves, um, has a little bit of space from one another, so when you look up very close, you can see each yarn individually because there's space left between each yarn and its, its neighbors. Um, so you can kind of see it, you know, turn and twist and turn in each direction in that kind of, you know, characteristic, can't, can't lay straight um, crepe uh, um, manner. It's super lightweight. It has a flowing, watery movement. Um, it's basically charmeuse. Uh, it has the same sort of watery drape and flow as charmeuse. It's just a little bit lighter, um, so therefore a little bit flowier, kind of, you know, kind of hangs in the air flow um, uh, as uh, charmeuse. Uh, it does have luster to it. 
it's kind of hard to see again because it is sheer so you don't have just that sheer density of fabric to give you that shininess um but it does have a less luster um and again that beautiful beautiful watery movement which again makes it uh no fun to sew <laughs> but super fun to watch at and uh super fun to wear Georgette. So Georgette and Chiffon are super similar. And a lot of times, even if you're looking at fabric, uh, I feel like fabric suppliers, which you would think know everything about fabrics, but sometimes I found don't, especially, you know, the guy that's working at the store today might not know everything. Uh, trust that he doesn't or she. Uh, but even if you look up this uh, fabric, a lot of times you'll just see Chiffon Georgette or Georgette Chiffon. They'll kind of just group chiffon and georgette together. And um, if you're looking at one that's not side by side with a nice example of the other, you can kind of be excused by mistaking the two. Sorry, I had to look the cat up. <laughs> um, but what do you do? There are differences. There are indeed uh, some differences between them. They're both sheer flowing fabrics made from silk. And of course, with both of these, they have uh, synthetic alternatives. You can get um, some synthetic chiffon, synthetic georgettes, uh, but traditionally these are silk fabrics. So what is the difference between the two? They're both sheer, they both flow, they're both made of silk, they're both made out of crepe yarns. Um, so basically georgette has a little bit less luster, is a bit heavier in weight, um and that's it <laughs> uh so you can see it. these are actually a really good example of the difference this it looks more opaque than it really is if you look just up here see it's doubled up it's it looks almost like it's it's not sheer at all but it is uh, where chiffon is very highly sheer georgette tends to be more semi sheer um and have a matte finish whereas chiffon can be a bit shinier um but again if you mess up the two, you'll be forgiven. Um, but if you see the two side by side, you should be able to tell the difference. But a lot of people, again, like I said, you, you Google the two um, and you see a lot of fabric wholesalers just kind of giving up on the difference. And they're not selling chiffon or georgette. They're selling georgette chiffon. <laughs> Organza. So organza is very much like chiffon in that it is a highly uh, sheer silk, uh, but it can be easily tell, told apart from uh, chiffon or georgette from that matter because of its stiffness. Whereas chiffon and georgette are super limp and super flowing, organza is very, very stiff. Surprisingly so for its very, very lightweight composition. Um, it's made with tightly twisted yarns, um, not crepe yarns, uh, in an open plain leaf. So that's another way you can tell it apart. Um, many times organza is used underneath garments to create shape and fullness, much like tulle is. Um, otherwise, you can create nice, big, voluminous shapes outside. So if you think about anything that sort of sticks out and is sheer, again, uh, organza is very, very stiff, so you're going to get that, those big shapes. It does not flow. It sticks right out. Um, that's what we think of organza uh, as being for. And again, we can layer it and use it underneath to create fullness. So I mentioned here tool. Let's talk about tool. So tool is a very, very interesting fabric. Um, it's probably most known for its synthetic counterparts today that are much stiffer and often used for shaping garments um, than can be seen on the outside. But sometimes we will use tool on the outside. And it comes in a variety of different characteristics. So tool that is specifically made to um, create shape underneath garments is very, very stiff and almost always synthetic, okay? Um, it was originally used, at, so if we think about tutus, uh, those, you know, poofy skirts that the ballerinas wore, it's made out of tulle and is very, very uh, stiff. And that's the kind we're really talking about when we use uh, for un what we call under construction. And that could be, you know, I could layer a tulle skirt if I have a very, if I have a gown that I want to have 
a lot of volume or a very big silhouette shape and I need to poof it out, I'll have a tool skirt or a tool under construction underneath to help, you know, uh, push out and create the volume and the shape that I want underneath that garment. However, it's not just a workhorse of under, workhorse of under construction. Uh, we have softer varieties um, and it's different ones that uh, uh, if we need uh, to use on the outside of garments. And again, a lot of tool today is synthetic. Um, however, we can still find silk tool and it was originally created with silk. Um, and the silk tool uh, is typically a bit softer than the super uh, stiff tool we might be used to for under construction. Um, and we can see it here in a very close up. We can see how it is sort of flown and it's being utilized in a you know, typical application of a you know, of long kind of flowing veil uh, for this bride. And we can use it for veils, we can use it for layering skirts, and it's very, very see-through. Now, the particular thing about tool is it's not woven per se. Um, so it is not, you know, woven in the way that we sort of have been looking at. Um, so you might say, oh, that's a, that looks like a very, you know, open plain weave. No, no, no. It's actually netted. So it's created in the same way we make maybe fishing nets or something like that, just very, very small. Uh, and it's actually created by sort of knotting together all the yarns. Um, so it's much more closely related uh, in construction to nets than other sort of, you know, woven fabrics. So we can't say it's a plain weave or we can't say it's a, it's a uh, uh, any other kind of weave or anything like that. It's, it's net. I mean, typically don't see that in fabric, but tool, tool's a little different. Other silks. So again, this is sort of my kind of grab bag of all the other silks that didn't really fall into these categories. <laughs> There's a few of them. We're going to start with China silk and habutai. So these two fabrics are very similar. That's why I'm sort of lumping them together, even though some people might be upset that I am. They are both soft, very lightweight, and very lustrous, beautiful silk fabrics woven with a tight, plain weave. They have a medium limp drape and are very delicate. In many cases, these silk fabrics, uh, the silk fabric names can be used almost interchangeably. Uh, but originally, habutai is Japanese silk, and China silk is, well, China, uh, or Chinese. Also, habutai is typically white or natural in color, and China silk is usually dyed. Um, and habutai can be a bit heavier in weight. Um, but of course, we can find China silk in white, and we can find dyed habutai. Um, so it doesn't really matter. I would say it's pretty safe um, sort of using these as interchangeable. Um, so again, what are we looking for? We're just looking for a very lightweight plain weave silk uh, that has a nice luster, a shiny luster, even though it does not have a satin weave. Uh, silk is so lustrous and a lot of times we can use the nicest uh, parts and the highest qualities uh, fibers so um, silk is so lustrous that we can get a luster without even using the satin fab uh, weave. We can still get it out of the plain weave um, uh, for these types of fabrics using these sorts of qualities of silks. Dupioni. So Dupioni, sorry about my, there's two ways of spelling it. I don't know which is right. One looks more Italian. This is probably like the English bastardization of the actual Italian word, which is down here. Um, you can spell it both ways. I'm sticking to my guns and saying it. <laughs> uh, Dupioni is an originally Italian fabric woven with slubbed yarns into a tight plain weave. So we talked a little bit about slubbed yarns before. So slubbed yarns um, are yarns that are spun to have irregularities in them. So some parts are thin, some parts are thick, some, some parts are kind of downright lumpy. Um, in Dubioni, the weft yarns have this slubbing effect, which gives the fabric a slightly textured ribbing. This fabric is very similar to Shantung, which we're going to see at the end of this section, um, but it's usually heavier in weight and with more heavy slubbing. And here you can see those slubs, these sort of lumps, 
We call those slubs in the yarn, and again, that's from weaving. And they only go across. That's because they're only in the weft grain, so they only go across. You don't see them go up and down. And this is true for Shantung and Dupioni. Um, so that's what you look for. Four ply silk. Look how creamy it looks. And trust me, it is. As we learned uh, before, plied yarns are yarns that are spun from finer yarns. So when we talk about four-ply four silk, that's silk that is woven from a silk yarn that is actually four finer yarns spun together. Um, again, the ply number um, tells you how many finer yarns have been spun to create that yarn. Four-ply silk is a medium weight silk that is very dense. And again, uh, a lot of times when we have higher plied yarns, the yar uh, fabric itself becomes very, very dense because we have something very fine and we're spinning it again, spinning it again, um, and then we um, weave it. And so we have gotten more fabric than just using a nice fine uh, singular yarn. Um, in an area. So it's very, very dense and it's known for its lovely full bodied yet still soft drape. It has a fluid movement and is usually woven in a plain weave uh, or sometimes other weaves can be used. Uh, we can even see this using crepe yarns. Actually, often we see a nice four ply silk in crepe. Again, crepe will help the flow a bit as well. Uh, it also has a medium luster, so not a high, high luster, um, but a medium one. So again, a little bit of a glow to it. And um, it has the sort of ability to flow like charmeuse. Charmeuse is, is shinier and lighter in weight, um, but because it's a little bit denser and a little bit heavier, it has a little bit more, let's say, body uh, than charmeuse. It's not quite as fluttery. It's a little bit more sort of grand in its flow. I don't know if any of those adjectives made sense. <laughs> matka. So matka is uh, made with large, slightly irregular silk yarns that have a subtle slubbing effect. So they're just, they're not, it's not huge. It's not like Dupioni where you see those big kind of globs, um, but you do see little flecks little irregular irregularities some places it's a little bit thinner some places it's a little bit thicker gives it a little bit more of a texture um, it has a dull luster and is woven using what's called the basket weave uh, now this is a variation of the plain weave that pairs warp and weft yarns together and then they uh, undergo the standard over under over under of the plain weave but they act as a pair we can see that here so it's over, under, over, under. We're just pairing our warp and weft yarns together as we go over, under, over, under. Uh, and this would be known as a two by two basket weave. So the two by two basket weave, it's really just saying pairing to weft, pairing to warp. Uh, and we can have other types of basket weave. So we can have um, like something, I, I didn't go over monk's cloth because it's, it's, it's a little bit on the esoteric side. If you think I'm getting kind of esoteric, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, unknown with these fabrics. Trust me, I could go way, way further. But there's something I didn't cover there called a monk's cloth, and it's typically cotton. It's a four by four basket weave. So they pair four uh, warp yarns with four weft year, uh, yarns together and then go over, under, over, under. So all of these sort of, uh, when we talk about a basket weave, it's basically a plain weave that has some sort of pairing of the warp and weft yarns together. Uh, and we usually use it to create um, almost like a pattern texture, like a very basic sort of pattern texture. Um, and you can see here that um, it is, it's sort of giving it a little bit more of a rougher texture. Um, you can definitely see the sort of crisscrossing uh, emphasis of the plain weave. It sort of emphasizes the normal sort of texture and pattern of the plain weave. Um, and again, if you get thicker yarns and do higher basket weaves, like four by four basket weaves, um, you get that uh, even more so. So the surface of Mecca is a slightly rough in texture, and this fabric is medium to heavy in weight. Noil. The name of this fabric refers to short, irregular, often waste fibers. In silk, these fibers come from the innermost part of the cocoon. 
Noil fibers can also be found uh, in other fiber types and can be used to make noil fabrics of different fibers. Uh, so there's wool uh, noils out there that again use similar sort of irregular short yarns. Uh, again, often uh, waste fiber yarns, uh, not particularly long, very, very short. Uh, but in all cases, noil is medium in weight uh, with a slight crispness and is characterized by this sort of rough pebble texture uh, from due to small bumps into the yarn. There are often also flecks of lighter and darker colors. So if we sort of look in here, again, it, we sort of might think they're slubs, but they're kind of rounder, almost like pilled effects, um, kind of bumpy, pebbled, um, much more so, much more prevalent than the sort of pebble texture we see in crepe. Um, and it's much more uneven. So the, the, the pebble texture we see in crepe fabrics is, is sort of even all over, where with noil we get, you know, big kind of bumps in some areas and almost nothing in another. Um, and overall, the overall is much more uneven, much more rough um, uh, to it. Panji. Panji is a lightweight plain weave silk, uh, and again, very similar to our China silk or Habutai. Uh, again, all of these guys being a lightweight plain weave silk. However, uh, we can tell Panji apart because it's very crisp and drape. Whereas China silk or habutai kind of flow and they're much more limp. Panji is quite crisp um, and is a bit more rough on the face. Uh, China silk and habutai have a very smooth face. Uh, and Panji typically has a duller luster than these fabrics. So all these things, if you find a lightweight plain leaf silk, it's rather stiff, doesn't have much of a, 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 a luster, um, it's probably Panji. Panji, be can found, Panji can be found in different weights, uh, and at its lightest weight, it can actually be close to semi-sheer. Shantung. So we mentioned this before, the Dupioni. So, uh, and it is indeed, Shantung is almost identical to Dupioni. Um, they basically are the same in respects of using slubbed weft yarns uh, to create a sort of uh, horizontal, or cross grain direction texture uh, with these uh, slub yarns, uh, weft yarns. These two fabrics, again, can be differentiated because Shantung is much lighter in weight and has a, a less dramatic slubbing. So it tends to have a slightly smoother first uh, surface, uh, where uh, Dupioni is, is heavier in weight and has a much heavier, rougher slubbing texture to it. Um, but they're both sort of crisp. Here you can see the difference between a Dupioni and a Shantung. This is a close-up of a Shantung. Uh, so you can see it's, it's, the slubbing effect is much more subtle. It's, it's really kind of almost barely noticeable. Uh, you have to kind of get in a little bit close, but the slubbing effect in Dupioni is kind of in your face. It's very, very rough, very, very thick. Um, and altogether, Dupioni is a heavier weight fabric. Silk Shantung is very, very lightweight, very, very, um, uh, um, kind of uh, uh, light and thin. Um, it also can depend uh, on what you're going to be making with this. Um, silk Shantung, because it's a lot thinner uh, and lighter in weight, tends to be a lot cheaper than our Dupioni. Shot silk. So shot silk is pretty neat. Um, and really shot fabric refers to any fabric that is woven with one color yarn in the weft direction and another contrasting colored yarn in the warp direction. Uh, we just typically see it a lot in silks because uh, that, um, in addition to the natural luster of silk, gives it this sort of beautiful kind of iridescence. Um, we see it in synthetic, of course, and again, you can have a, a shot fabric um, in other fabric fibers as well. Um, it's just, again, very, very common in uh, silk fabrics, and especially silk fabrics like taffeta or shantung or uh, others like that. And here we have, you can see it has a shot fabric, blue in one direction, yellow in the other direction. So when blended together, um, again, you get sort of these multicolored, kind of almost iridescent-like effect. Sarah. 
Sarat is a traditionally Indian fabric named for Sarat India. It is a smooth, lightweight twill silk that is usually printed but can be found in solid colors as well. This fabric is very similar to Silk Aberdeen, and if you see some Sarat and call it Silk Aberdeen, I'll excuse you. Same if you find some Silk Aberdeen and call it Sarat, I'll excuse you. I think I, it's similar enough that you can kind of use them interchangeably. So much for that Sarah has different names to it. So sil Sarah can also be called silk foulard, Thai silk, or just sometimes plain silk twill. Um, so again, if we call it silk twill, we're just identifying the fiber and the weave. Taffeta, another one of our famous silk fabrics. And it is very famous for its ability to create voluminous silhouettes and it's a pleasant, soft, rustling sound. So when you walk and it sort of rustles together, it has this um, soft rustling sound. And it's actually called a scroop, that sound. <laughs> Who would have known? Um, uh, Christian Dior was very famous for using lots of taffeta to create his new look. So that was, uh, you know, revolved around these big, voluminous skirts um, that, you know, puffed out lots and lots of fabric. Um, uh, big, big silhouettes that puffed out. And again, he relied on the body and stiffness of taffeta to create those shapes. Um, but taffeta is a very old fabric. Taffeta um, has been used for ages. And again, just like Duchess Satin, has a long history with, um, uh, you know, aristocratic dress and things like that. Here we can see a sort of, you know, very old sort of style dress. Uh, this is, uh, looks like it's, it's shot taffeta. So you see how it kind of has that iridescent quality to it, kind of two-tone quality to it. It's probably because it's a, it's a shot taffeta. Um, but very, very, you see those big puffy sleeves. You get that big shape, these uh, uh, big, you know, uh, voluminous drape with it. Very kind of stiff, falls in that way. Um, and so taffeta is a smooth, light to medium weight silk woven with a plain weave with a fine, tightly spun warp yarns and slightly heavier weft yarns. And depending on the kind of taffeta you can look, uh, the heavier weft yarns might be very, very subtle to the point where you don't really notice them being heavier. Um, where some taffetas, uh, the heavier weft yarns can create almost like a ribbing pattern that you can see uh, very easily in the texture. It is fairly stiff and has a moderate to high luster. Tessa. Tessa silk. This fabric is made from wild silk moth cocoons that are rougher than the cultivated kind. Tessa silk is often left undyed to keep their natural tannish brown color. Now it's usually a little bit irregular, the yarns and uneven. Sometimes you'll have slubbing effects. This is because um, when we cultivate from wild silk moth cocoons, the silk moth cocoons don't unravel quite as nicely as our cultivated kinds. So we have to kind of just shred them up and take the fibers and spin them, which gives you a little bit more of a rougher, uneven silk uh, than, you know, the silks used and, and created from our cultivated uh, silk moth, which again gives you those fine, shiny, beautiful, smooth yarns. Um, and again, we typically leave it undyed so we get this sort of natural tannish color. Uh, the fabrics made from this fiber usually are heavy in weight, stiff, and have a rough texture and uneven color. Velvet. The well-known piled silk fabric. You know, again, a lot of these, most of these silk fabrics are, you know, everybody knows. They're so famous. Um, this is a very luxurious fabric and is very expensive when made with silk and not the cheaper synthetic version. So this is another great example of how fabric gets really expensive. It is uh, not as complex a weave as we were talking before with like the Metal SA, which uses the Jacquard weave, but it's still a slightly more complex weave because we have to weave the fabric like normal and then we have to uh, weave in that extra set of filler yarns that are gonna be raised up uh, to create the pile. And it's a cut pile, so the pile is created and then kind of cut 
um, uh, for velvet, so it, we don't have the loops in the pile. We just have a little sort of uh, 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 furry fibers sticking up without the loops that we see in like chenille or terry cloth. Um, sorry, not chenille, but terry cloth. And boucle. Trying to think of other looped piles. <laughs> it's much more like uh, velveteen, of course, we see in cotton. Um, and, and corduroy is another one of our piled fabrics. So it's a slightly more complex, but again, with all that different fiber in there, um, it's quite dense. And to create a sort of plush furriness, we need a lot of fiber. And we're using silk, again, our most expensive fiber. So silk velvet, 100% um, silk, silk velvet is so expensive and luxurious, you almost can't find it. Um, so when we see, even when they say 100% silk velvet, it typically, typically means that the pile itself, the fluffy stuff, is silk, where the background uh, or the backing fabric that it's inserted into or woven into is usually rayon. Um, most of the time, you're just going to see synthetic velvet, um, which is 100% rayon. So uh, in all cases, whether it's rayon or silk, your velvet is soft, it's plush, it's limp, it's heavy in weight, and has a dull luster. Now it's of course very, very warm, and especially if you get the actual silk velvet, because silk is very warm, um, it's very inflative. Um, this it is a very, very warm and insulating fabric. So do not use lightly, and do not use in the summer. Velvet varieties. So we're going to expand on our velvet uh, topic a little bit, um, just because it's worth it. We have a lot of velvet varieties. Um, and overall varieties, again, aren't necessarily silk. Uh, velvet, again, is a traditionally silk fabric. Velveteen is velvet made with cotton. Um, so we have that other sort of fiber variety. That's sort of how we tell it apart. Um, and all these varieties that I go over can be made out of, uh, of course, synthetic fab fabrics and fibers. Uh, and many of the times are uh, made almost solely out of uh, synthetic fabrics. Um, but again, since velvet is a traditionally silk fabric, these are all sort of traditional um, uh, silk finishes, or at least I feel fit within the silk category. Okay, our first uh, velvet variety is called a burnout. So burnout fabrics refer to fabrics that use the pile of the velvet, but only in some areas of the fabric to create lovely designs and patterns. Burnouts are usually two-toned, two but one color for the pile and one for the background. But they can come in more colors or be only one color. Uh, the two colors, though, tend to sort of bring out the pattern. As you can see here, these, are, this is sort of, these two are using a sort of gray uh, backing color and have a colored pile that allows the uh, color of the pile, again, to uh, in design. Uh, to show very nicely. So all these areas are sort of that are fluffy, like the velvet, but again, only in some areas where we have can create these sort of beautiful patterns. Uh, Burrows use the pattern velvet designs on many different fabric types. Um, so you can see this on, uh, you know, sh sometimes sheer fabric. So a lot of times we'll see burnouts on sheer. So the background here will be sheer, of course, um, the, this part will not be sheer. Oops, sorry guys. Um, but this background will, but it doesn't always necessarily have to have that. Sometimes it's opaque, sometimes it's plain leaves, sometimes it's twill. Um, all kinds of different varieties uh, of burnouts. But when we're talking about this sort of, you know, not all over plushness, but sort of patterned plushness, we're talking about a burnout. Crushed velvet. So this process uh, refers to a process where we create our velvet uh, uh, fabric just sort of as normal, um, but then we sort of press the pile with heat to quote unquote crush it. And it gives this sort of detailed patterns giving kind of an all over unevenness or kind of patchiness to the luster of the velvet. Most of the time when we see crushed velvet today, it is synthetic. It's a little bit easier to apply the crushed finish to a synthetic velvet than it is to a silk velvet. 
Crushed Velvet is probably, you know, one of the favorite, what is it? It was like every ice skater or figure skater in like the 90s had Crushed Velvet on there uh, for a uh, costume. All right, let's talk about other silk finishes. Um, just to round it out, we have an embossed finish. Uh, so embossing is a process uh, by which any type of fabric or leather, so again, we see it a lot of times in uh, silks, but we can see it in other fabrics as well. Um, and embossing is pressing or stamping uh, the fabric with engraved rollers, leaving a pattern. Heat is usually involved to help, uh, 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 sorry, heat is usually involved and often the fabric has a property to help hold the pattern. Um, so something like with silk here, this is almost like uh, uh, an embossed fabric, but with crushing. Crushing we typically don't do with fabric, but this is a velvet and this is, can be either sort of a, a halfway between a crushed velvet and an embossed velvet, depends on who you ask. Uh, but sort of showing the technique of it too, which I kind of wanted to show. So sometimes it's done in rollers. This is, you know, very slow and kind of a, an at-home process where this is a sort of metal stamp that's heated up and then pressed down to create patterns and textures. Um, here's another example. This is probably rolled on similar to almost how fabric is printed, but it's not ink on the print. It's usually just applying heat with an engraved roller in different sections to affect the shininess um, of the fabric and kind of quote unquote emboss these uh, patterns onto it. When used for silk fabric, it tends to emphasize the luster of the silk. Moiré. So moiré is a type of embossing that we just talked about. And it is very, very popular. So popular that I'm giving it its own category in finishing. And um, again, embossing is where large heated rollers are passed over the surface of silk. Typically taff taffeta, we typically use the moiré finish on taffetas, but of course we can use it on other ones. We just typically see it on that type of fabric. Um, basically what happens is uh, the heated rollers create this sort of wood grain pattern um, by, you know, changing the luster of the fabric with the heat and altering it. Moiré is also sometimes called watered silk because this pattern can kind of look like flowing water. Um, I always tend to relate it more to wood grain, but hey, if some people think it looks like water, go for it. Apparently, since they call it, it's often called watered silk, more people think it looks like water because it's not called wood silk. So, I guess I'm wrong. Okay, this is our last finish, and this will conclude our section on silk. And it's sand washing. We actually saw sand washing in denim as a denim finish before, and it's uh, very similar. Um, it's where silk, uh, and a lot of times charmeuse, although we, of course, we can finish any sort of fabric with a sand wash if we so choose. But we typically see it on charmeuse, um, and it's when the fabric is washed or rubbed with sand, sometimes with sandpaper. Um, and the tiny abrasive grains of sand soften the feel of fabric. It kind of, you know, raises up almost a little bit of a pile. It's very, very subtle, not really noticeable, but it kind of gives us this kind of uh, very kind of velvety feel, very soft, very, very soft, especially when applied to charmeuse. Um, and it gives the fabric a slightly weathered look and reduces the luster somewhat. So this is a charmeuse that has been uh, sand washed. That wraps up our uh, section on silk. I have one more that's gonna be skins and synthetics and then we'll move back on to sketching. Uh, but hopefully you've found this helpful. Um, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye guys.